Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the Geo Coast. Um, today we are with Jimmy Murphy in the Mari Center in Cork Harbor. Uh, hello, Jimmy. Hello, Max. Pleased to meet you. Um, so, uh, Jimmy, can you please tell us a few words about the work that you do here? Okay, so I just described myself first. My name is Jimmy Murphy. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering in UCC, and so for the last 25 years I've been working on research in UCC related to coastal engineering and offshore renewable energy. What would be the main focus of your research uh, at the moment? Okay, yeah, I suppose all through my career I, I've, I've been working on coastal engineering and I continue to work on coastal engineering. So that, that work involves a number of different aspects. It involves physical model testing of coastal structures. It involves going out on site and measuring beach processes and beach behavior. And um, also it involves numerical modeling, you know, so whenever you want to change the marine environment, what we do is that we create a numerical model of it and we, we examine the impact of developments on, on, on that, uh, that marine environment. So we do a lot of studies looking at the piers, harbours, coastal protection works, discharges such as um, sewage treatment plants into water bodies and their impact on the environment. So that, that's one whole aspect of, of, of what I do. A second part of what I do relates to, to offshore renewable energy and offshore renewable energy refers to, to wind energy, wave energy and tidal energy. So there's um, an incredible resource available in Ireland, particularly for wind and wave, that is not exploited at the moment. And, and our job here in the Marai Centre is to try and develop technologies that are capable of operating and surviving in that marine environment. So again, we, we use techniques such as physical testing, which you will see later in, in the video, and and, and numerical modeling as well mm. to understand how these structures will behave, how much power they'll produce and whether they can survive wave conditions which can be as high as 30 meters. And talk about, talking about coastal engineering, mm -hmm. from my own personal experience I know it's quite important in the context of coastal zone management yeah. and especially in the context of potential climate change and sea mm -hmm. level rise in the future. So. Has the, you've been doing this, as you said, from mid-90s, yeah? Yeah, yeah. and from your point of view, has there been any technological advance in the technologies used for coastal protection over the last 25 years? Or are we well, still using yes. the same well, techniques? Well, what I would say is that the, the, the methods and techniques that we employ are the same as that were used in the, the mid-1990s and even before mm -hmm. that. But, uh, but what I would think is that our understanding of their impacts on the coastal systems are better now than they were then. You know, so back in the, the 90s and 80s, you know, sort of you, you, um, you, you deployed revetments and detached mm -hmm. breakwaters and groins and all that, but it wasn't fully understood what impact they, they would have. And, and even still at the moment, we don't fully understand the impact of structures on, on a marine environment. But, but we are improving all the time through techniques, better modeling techniques, better monitoring of their behavior. So, so I think you know, while, while methodologies and techniques for protecting our coastline are, are largely the same, you know, we, we can pick our, our technique better now. You know, so mix and match them in a better that's way. That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah, because in the past you, you could put a groin where a detached breakwater would mm -hmm. be better, you know. So we, 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 we can better fit a solution to a, an environment now than what could be done previously. And correct me if I'm wrong, groins are kind of parallel fences. That's right, yeah. Which so perpendicular to the yeah. beach to stop <coughs> longshore drift. That's right, yeah. And I, I think in the past, what I've seen in a lot of locations is that groins were put in places where there have been no longshore drifts. And if you have no longshore drift, there's no point in having a groin. So mm -hmm. they're, they're pointless in that situation. And there's a lot of examples in Ireland where that has been done. So, it, for example, in Yule, I think they're kind of semi-destroyed and they've probably been put in the right, way before and, 90s. That's yeah. right, yeah. And, you know, there, there, there's examples in Bantry and Waterville as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so for groins, you need a movement of sediment along the coast. So you need, you need sediment and it has to be moving in a certain direction. And if you don't have those two things, there's no point in groins. You know. I think, if I remember correctly, I've seen groins on one of the paintings from 1800, from the 19th century, somewhere in France. Mm -hmm. So, 
it must be an old technique which people it use is, like it, it, for a long yeah. time, like over hundred years. It is an old technique, and it's a, you know it's a technique that has been successful in many locations and unsuccessful in many locations as well because. You know, sort of the attitude was that if it works in this location, it can work in another location as well. And it was just fitted on locations where it wasn't suitable. But now we know through modeling and monitoring the best locations to put groins and what their impact will be on, on an environment. Mm -hmm. So, but does it mean that even in 19th century, people were already concerned with longshore sediment drifts? They were, they were concerned with erosion, uh -huh. you know, in terms of protecting infrastructure along the coastline. I suppose that, that, that was, was a concern back then as well, you know, I suppose historically, you know, sort of people like living close to the sea, and my view is people live too close to the sea, mm -hmm. you know, so it would be a lot better if we didn't have to put structures in on the coastline. And from your knowledge, like, you've been designing and kind of advising the government on what type of coastal infrastructure to put in place, like, but like, except drawings, what other coastal protection techniques go back in centuries like what in like in other words like what could be related to technological heritage if you like i suppose you know sort of revetments and walls mm -hmm. are the most common methods used you know you know the easiest way to, to solve the problem is to, to put a, a physical barrier in the way yeah. of the, the water you know so that has been in the way of of, of walls historically so sea walls in the 19th century were very common but what happened then is that they had a very negative impact on beaches in that all the sediment was pulled out in front of the wall and a lot of these walls collapsed. Because it was a backwash. Yeah. That's right, yeah, of reflection and scouring yes. at the base of the wall. So, so obviously vertical structures aren't a good idea on a soft coastline, you know, so that, that's a lesson that has been learned a long ago, you know, sort of, but revetments are, have, are a good solution in, in a lot of locations, you know. It scatters the energy of the It way. scatters, you break the energy over the structure, you know, so, you know, in the past, and you see examples around Ireland of revetments and they're, they're sort of vertical, they, the rock is stacked. Yes. And that's a bad idea, you know, <laughs> sort of in terms of the, the impact on the beach, but, you know, sort of new revetments you know, sort of have a much flatter slope. And when you have a flatter slope, the wave breaks over mm -hmm. a, a longer area. Like I remember back in, I think it was the late 1990s, early 2000s, I, I was involved in a scheme down in Waterville. It's called Leany Beach mm -hmm. for the golf course there. And um, I was pushing for a very flat slope revetment, you know, sort of it's sort of a slope, it's called one and 2.5. So every one vertical you go across 2.5. Mm -hmm. So it's a flat slope. And the problem with a flat slope is that it requires a lot more rock and so it's more expensive to, more expensive to build. Yes. But the golf course went with it. And you know, prior to the revetment being built, the people couldn't walk along the beach you know, at high tide mm -hmm. because there wasn't enough sand. You know, the water level would come right in yes. to, the, to the doom phase. So it has changed. So when the revetment was built, you know, what happened is that the waves came in and they, they washed into the revetment and the sand was deposited mm -hmm. and the beach levels rose and, you know, it, it improved the beach. Okay. You, you, you know, so you can, you, you can get a positive impact in certain locations mm -hmm. from, from a revetment if you build it right, you know. But at the same time, you don't want revetments everywhere. We don't want our whole coast covered in rock. Mm -hmm.